Hey, Julie. Initially, I thought I would call you to talk about how the portrait came together because I wanted you to have like the full backstory and everything. Um, but after I thought about it, I realized I would also want to have this conversation with other people. So rather than <laughs> call you individually, I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone by um, recording myself talking about this because I'm, to be perfectly honest, a little too lazy to just write it all down. So um, in, dis in January of 2017, I contacted you about doing your portrait. Um, and the, the beginnings of this starts kind of with two people. Um, first is Oliver Jeffers and then Lori, uh, Larry Torres. So <clears throat> Oliver did this portrait series where he painted a portrait, a full portrait, and then he dipped it and, it, and aptly named the series the Dipped Portrait Series. And each of his models, to some extent, had experienced loss. And so that, that theme of loss is communicated by the fact that part of the portrait is completely unseen and permanently lost to anyone who would ever look at it. So, you, And it's a really striking thing because, compositionally, faces are interesting. When you see a face in a piece of art, you, you just gravitate to it. Like people see faces in everywhere. You know, it's very, it's a very human perceptual thing to look for a face in, in something completely inanimate. So to have a portrait is immediately engaging. It's totally different than a landscape or a still life where it's, you look at it, you scan it, you understand what's going on, and then you're kind of done. A portrait invites the viewer to spend some time with it and to make eye contact with the sitter and, and or the model and, and then to break eye contact and look around and understand the face and, and, and try to see what you can read in, in the face of, of the model. So portraits are great because when you dip them, you have this tension between knowing that there's something there and not being able to really grasp the full composition. You know that there's a composition, but a lot of it is a loss. And it was really, really interesting to me. So I wanted one of those paintings for myself. Which brings, so that's Oliver Jeffers bringing us to Larry Torres. So Larry was um, a former Disney animator and early on in my career, he was one of my creative directors. And Larry said that when he worked for Disney, <clears throat> one of the things they told them was, if you, if you like a, a painting, if you like a movie, if you like something beautiful, and you know you could do it yourself, then why would you buy it? Just go home and make it for yourself. So that's what I'm kind of doing. So this this portrait is completely der derivative, blah, derivative of Oliver's work, but I wanted to attempt it because I thought, one, I thought it'd be fun. Two, I haven't really painted since college, which was 12 years ago. Um, and I've been itching to get my paints back out. In fact, the, the very oils that I used to put this one together were the ones that sat in my grandfather's painting box that I used when I was in college. So the oils themselves, a miracle, I think, that they actually survived, but really fun to get, like, literally pick off right where I left off with painting. So, so that's this. So with this particular one, um, I started with the frame. So knowing that I was going to dip it, I wanted a frame that had a sense of history, um, felt kind of aged, and most importantly, had a lot of crenellated texture to it. So when you dip it, you get, uh, you know, dipping it in a high gloss something, preferably, uh, you you really see the detail of what's in the frame. So I went to an antique store here in North Carolina and I found this frame. Um, it had uh, glass in it and it had nothing in it. So I'm not, I didn't, I promise I didn't destroy a pre-existing um, piece in order to put this together. Um, I bought the frame for 20 bucks and the frame itself has on this layer of the frame, this thicker textured bit, um, and a canthus primrose motif. So immediately the frame's kind of feminine, so I knew I wanted to put a female face in it um, so that the painting, it, so it, in the end, it looked like the frame was chosen to match the subject matter rather than the other way around. So, um, and, so that's why it had to be female. I've already painted two portraits of my wife and she doesn't really <laughs> like being <laughs> the subject of paintings. And knowing that this would is going to hang in my office at work, I thought it would be interesting to paint someone 
who's not my wife because the immediate assumption is that people will make is that oh is she your wife and then i'll say no and then there's this weird kind of like oh you're an artist but why not your wife and so there's a weird kind of like tension there potentially um that i wanted to play on just to mess with people but i also wanted to paint you because even though you're states away um i knew as an artist you'd be able to send me source material that with with the idea in mind that this would be painted so you wouldn't just send me a photo off from facebook shot on an iphone where there's no depth you would think about your appearance and um how your hair would lay and the light falling on your face and all those other details and you've sent me great stuff uh the photos you've sent me were fantastic and wonderful to work with um i loved that your eye and hair color matched the necklace you were wearing and you were very thoughtful about how you did your makeup and everything so it's from the get-go you i knew you would give me the right source material and you totally did um so that became the painting so in doing picking up painting after 12 years uh i had some challenges so the first thing i did was a value study a pencil sketch of how the composition might look, where the face might fall in, in the picture plane, um, how far it might appear to the viewer. And uh, that was very successful. And then I learned very quickly, as you mentioned, that drawing and painting are completely separate things. They, I mean, uh, just worlds apart, the difference in the way of thinking and, and in the process of, of even coloring in a painting um, from each other. So I primed you can actually see it here i primed this board it's a um, 16 by 20 uh pastel board and uh start the sketch looked good and i did the sketch in pencil um, so i measured everything out and was really painstaking about the sketch for the first attempt um laid in the darks and then the values were off and I didn't really realize that until I had started coloring things in and mixing skin tones and it was bad. I didn't, I didn't like it at all. So I uh, dipped my rag in thinner and wiped the whole thing off, losing the original sketch um, and put a solid tone on it all over again, gessoed over the whole deal and started afresh. This time I was, I decided for sake of speed to sketch everything in using just oil paint. So I did, uh, so with it primed, with it toned, uh, with the canvas tone or the board tone, um, sketch, did a sketch, initial sketch with the oil, um, looked great. And then I started painting in and I was running into the same problem. The colors were kind of muddy and it, just didn't live there wasn't any truth to it um it looked flat and i decided to just go ahead and finish it um and see how far i could get and see what i could learn so i i did finish it it's this thing here it looks terrible so i'm not even going to bring it up here to show you um i took photos and sent those to you julie so maybe you're the only one that'll ever see how bad that was but it was flat the values were off the shadows were too warm the highlights were too cool it was it, it just did not and it looked terrible i ended up straying somewhat from the sketch so you, the nose was elongated and the lips were off to one side and it came across as kind of like pre-cubist in appearance and it was it, it's just bad it, terrible 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 work so i went uh the very next day to hobby lobby and i got some cheap canvas board and decided, you know, if I'm going to attempt this again and ruin it, I may as well do it on something that isn't going to cost too much. So I bought three, a pack of three canvas boards for $14, came home, set one, one of them up, laid in a base tone, um, started sketching with the oil, and um, I got a sketch down, looked good. One side was a little too high, one eye was a little too low, um, the mouth was a little askew. So I, and sketching in oil ended up being beneficial at that point I realized because you could push the oil around a little bit you could lift the paint up and reapply it and, and to really get a good solid sketch so once the sketch was down um, I <clears throat> laid in the background 
and then I late started mixing the dark tones and I decided to take a very specific approach. Um, I wanted to, I was by this time, like having to live with a, a couple failures under my belt. I, it made me start to think about well, what kind of, how should this look if I can't achieve anything real off the bat? What, what exactly am I striving for? Um, and I, I kind of fell back on the work of John Singer Sargent. And one thing, one guiding thought for him was this thing he called the economy of means. And by that he meant that if you lay, if you put your brush to the canvas, you touch it once, you reserve your energy, you reserve the paint, and in as few strokes as possible, in as little effort as possible, but as deliberately as possible, lay in the image that you want to achieve. So instead of touching your brush to the canvas and then blending and then touching again and then really, oh, I like that, and then keep touching it because it feels good, know what you want to do, do it, and then stop. So this economy of means is as little energy as possible, as little pain as possible, and which really means as soon as you put a stroke down, you're committed to it. So that's the, the approach I took. The other reason why I like that approach is because once you've got the paint on the canvas and you're done, you end up with something that's very painterly. You, you see the strokes and you see the contrasts in the decisions between the lights and darks and where the highlights land and everything like that. But effectively, it pushes the viewer away from the canvas because in order to, for it to look real, you have to take a step back. It's kind of like a pixelated image. When you, when you take a small image that looks clear on the computer and blow it up, the pixels are huge and you lose the image to a certain degree, but which forces you to step away. And by making it small again, or taking, taking a few steps away from the computer monitor, you re, you regain in your perception, the verisimilitude of the image. So, and I felt that that played well with a sense of loss and dipping because not only is there that loss, but there's also a, a measure of distance, um, forced on the viewer by the way that the painting's done. So, I laid in the darks, I mixed some mid-tones and paid very close attention to uh, the, not only the value, but also the hue as in comparison to the source material. Um, and when I laid a, a brush stroke down, I left it there and it made me think very deliberately, it made me more careful. And even though I did this in one sitting in maybe four or five hours, it forced me to take my time and and really evaluate the decisions that I was making as I was going. So in the end, um, there were only like three places perhaps in the entire image where I blended strokes that had been previously placed. Um, one thing that was important was to lose this line, uh, this receding line uh, of the face as um, as the flesh curves away into the shadow, it was important to get that as soft as possible so that it kind of vanishes. I felt like, it, especially right here, if on this side, if it were a hard line, it would feel too rigid, um, which is something I learned from the, the terrible painting. Really clean lines um, are sometimes not the, the best way to go. It almost connotes a shadow line rather than a form turning into, into space. Um, yeah, and so I'm excited to dip it. Uh, my brother is currently building the dip mechanism, the a wooden box that's gonna hold all the paint. I'm leaning toward a high gloss yellow, uh, just to contrast with the blue. Um, I did paint the necklace deliberately thick, so there's a lot of tooth, there's a lot of texture to the paint of the necklace part here, here, um, being raised up from the canvas and I'm hoping that after the dip you'll see some of that texture showing through so, so the viewer will know there's something there um, even though the image is completely lost. It's been interesting to me um, as a side note as I've shown this to a few people to get the a very negative react a very strong and negative reaction to the idea of dipping at all. Um, the sense of loss even before it's dipped is very real for a lot of people and I think that's perversely probably all the more reason to dip it um, simply because it, it I know that the response that I'm looking for in the dip is 
uh, already pretty real. Um, and I, and that's a total credit to Oliver Jeffers' first initial idea of dipping a portrait at all. Um, it's a, it's effective in delivering to the viewer a very strong, palpable reaction that probably isn't, it's easily achieved and probably isn't there for a lot of people that think about, um, you know, going to a museum and being moved by a piece of art. Um, the other reason why I think it's okay to dip it is because the way that most people experience art today isn't really in a museum. It's through a Pinterest board or through the website of, through, of an artist or um, in downloading images from uh, a resource like the Metropolitan Museum of Art's online image collection or the like. So a lot of people are experiencing art digitally more so than they are in person. Um, so I, to that end, um, and as a kind of compromise, uh, I found a place that will do a high resolution Giclier quality scan of the painting. So once it's completely dry, um, and varnished, I'll be taking it down to get scanned. So it can exist in the most accessible format possible, digitally online available to people, but the object itself will be lost. Um, and I kind of like that. Um, you could almost think of it as printmaking, you know, the plate, the object that generates the art, um, might be canceled by the printmaker or might be lost entirely to history, but the art still exists. So in, in, in an artistic way, in a, in an accessible way, this image will survive. Um, but as an object, it will be, I'm totally going to dip it. I'm going to dip it so hard. It's going to be gone and lost forever. And I think that's part of the art. So I don't apologize to the critics for dipping it. Um, I think maybe the failure falls to me for showing it to anyone before I dipped it. Um, but I'm hoping that I can satisfy the critics in at least making it available digitally. So um, that's the story of this piece. Um, thanks for modeling. And for those who are watching this video, um, for the first time, perhaps not knowing what this project was all about. I hope that's informative. And I hope that you check out the work of Oliver Jeffers, because he's doing some really interesting stuff, not just in dipping paintings, but conceptually, he's really playing with painting and, and, um, and image making as a medium, as a form of art in really interesting ways. Um, and I think to a certain degree, reviving realism as a, as a respected form of of image making in the art community rather than being completely abstract or just conce conceptual in nature. So, um, yeah, that's it.